like to welcome you to the First Baptist Church today. In the ways of announcements, following worship service today, we will have Sunday school at 5 p.m. The First Baptist Church children and youth will meet. Tuesday, July 18th, the Lisa Simmons Circus will meet at noon. Um, Wednesday, July 19th, they'll have the community dinner, choir practice, and Bible study. Um, and also, there is a special announcement that all deacons will meet following the morning worship service for a short meeting. Um, Pastor Mark will be at Parchment Valley on Monday and Tuesday. If you have a need, please call the church office, and a deacon will be contacted. The Back to School Bash is scheduled for August the 13th. That's Sunday from 2 to 4 in the parking lot. There will be food, school supplies, and backpacks, which will be given out to each student attending. Hot dogs, chips, drinks will also be provided to the people. On Friday, July 28th, we'll have a ladies' night out, Christmas in July. We will meet here at the church between 5.30 and 5.45, load up the van, and then we will go to Kathy Fisher's home, away from home, I'm not sure where that is, for an evening of fellowship, fun, laughter, and food. Each lady is attending is asked to bring a small gift for a white elephant exchange, nothing over $10, and bring your favorite homemade snack. And um, this will be a time of greeting, so just Okay, our praise course today is For the Love of God, Blue Book, page 38. One more thing I forgot to announce. We have a Red Cross blood drive scheduled for August the 2nd, 1 to 6, at the Lewis County EMS building. If you're able to give a little bit of your time, please sign up on the educational side. And also, the Heavens Army Youth Revolution 2023 will be August the 4th and 5th at South Buchanan Mission Church. The food trucks will be there between 5 and 6 and worship at 6.30. Do we have any prayer concerns? My daughter in law, Randy Cahill, was having back surgery in the morning. And also, uh, her friend, Patrick St. Julian, was admitted to a hospital now. Uh, I just wanted to bring her on the He wanted to have pancreatic cancer. So, and I have an unspoken. Okay. Uh, we need to remember Roger Wolf, who's uh, currently in the ER. I didn't hear. Okay. Dan Johnson. Okay, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Thank you for the opportunity to worship you here today. Please be with each person that was mentioned today and those that was unspoken. Be with our Pastor Mark as he brings our message. Please join me in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day. 
Raise us up to as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the God is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Okay, we'd like the children come forward for children's chat with Kim Evans. to bake with your mom or your grandma? I have baking stuff. You do? So you like to bake? So when you bake, does mom follow a recipe or get out a cookbook? Get out a recipe card? I have a cookbook with my cooking stuff. You do? Do you ever get out a recipe card, something that looks like this? Do you use a cookbook? Yeah. Yeah? Sometimes? Okay. Well, why is it important if uh, we follow a recipe? What does a recipe tell us? Does it tell us what ingredients to use? And how much of each ingredient? <coughs> right. Okay, so for example, if we were going to make chocolate chip cookies, and we, what would happen if we put like too much salt in the chocolate chip cookies? They would taste bad, wouldn't they? Yeah. And then what if we didn't put the chocolate chips in the cookies? We wouldn't have any chocolate chip cookies, would we? Yeah. <laughs> okay. So did you know that God has given us a recipe on how to live our lives? Do you know where we find that recipe? Do you know that there's a book where we find it? Do you know what this is? Do you know what this is? The Bible? So that's where we find it. Just like the baker decides which ingredients combine for the perfect tasty treat, God has determined what we need in our lives to make them better. God didn't write the recipe so that our lives would be boring or hard to live. He wrote his recipe for life to help us know how to live happy, healthier lives. He gathered the ingredients, he wrote the recipe, and he gave us rules, and he sent his son Jesus as a living example of how to follow these rules. Listen to John, 1 John chapter 2, 5 through 6. But if anyone obeys his word, God's love is truly made complete in him. This is how we know we are in him. Whoever claims to live in him must walk as Jesus did. So, if we live our lives in the way that God intended, according to his perfect recipe, we will live lives that are full of God's blessings. So just remember, just like we use a recipe for to bake something, God has given us a recipe in the Holy Bible to live our lives so we'll be, it'll be full of blessings, okay? All right, let's say a little prayer. Can we bow for a little prayer? Our hands together. Ready? Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for these children. Thank you for creating us. Thank you for giving us the perfect example in your Son, Jesus Christ. Help us to fill our lives with the perfect ingredients, obey your commands, and follow your recipe to live a life like Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Thank you, Kim. Um, our praise hymn for today is Heavenly Sunlight, page 369 or up above.
we bring our offerings to you, we give back to you the abundant blessings that you have given to us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you this morning for this opportunity of being in your house. And, and Father, we just thank you for each one that's here, each one that's with us by way of live stream. And Father, we uh, lift up all those that are missing today, many who are, are traveling. We just pray for their, for their safe travels. And, and Father, for those that are missing, uh, Father, those that would love to be with us and for health reasons and, and work reasons, just just can't be here today. We just uh, pray that you would be with them and that you would be, in, Father, in each situation. Whatever that need might be, Father, we just lift them up to you and just pray that uh, your hand would be upon them. Father, bring healing and bring peace. Father, we just pray that you would bring hope where that hopelessness might be in, in that life. Father, we, uh, we again just thank you for the presence of your spirit with us this morning. We thank you for this opportunity to come together in fellowship to, to worship and praise you. We thank you for your word this morning. And Father, I just pray that you would be with me as I, as I share your word today. Father, just uh, make us receptive. Open us up. Father, just open our hearts and minds that we might have understanding to what it is that you would speak to each one of us today. Father, be with us in our Sunday school hour. Be with each teacher, each student. And Father, be with us as we, as we leave today and move into the world. Father, let us be that, that light of Christ, that, that little flicker of hope. Father, again, we just thank you and we praise you for your goodness to us, your, your blessings to each one of us, to our families, to our church. And Father, we just uh, praise you and love you. And, and Father, all these things I just ask in the precious name of Jesus. Amen.
morning it just seems like everyone's just kind of blah so uh, it, it was good to, to hear the, the choir sing and we have reason to be on our feet shouting to heaven today because he did set us free amen so uh, even in the the blahness of the day praise God we have reason to celebrate this morning <laughs> Amen, Doris. Thank you, Doris. I can always count on you. <laughs> she kids me that uh, every time she sees me or every time I see her, I, I have that look on my face. And, and I probably do because uh, really I don't know what's coming when I see Doris. And, uh, <clears throat> but it's, it's good to, to see you this morning. It's good to be a part of this today to be here and, and just celebrate and praise God and be a part of this worship service. Um, <clears throat> there are many on our prayer list. I want to encourage you to continue to remember to, to pray for all of those um, that are hurting within our church, within our church family and the community. There are just uh, a lot of needs. Uh, I remind you that we will have Bible study this Wednesday, even though uh, I'll be going Monday, Tuesday to seminary. I'll be back, and we will have Bible study, Lord willing, on uh, Wednesday evening. So if you can be a part of that and have been a part of that, uh, please please come out Wednesday evening. Uh, when you were a child, and I realize that some of you are going to have to stretch your, your memories a little, little more than some others. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, but when you were a child, did, did you ever do something that, that you shouldn't have done? And, and then when, you're, when your mother called you out on it, you responded with something like, well, Tommy did it first, or uh, maybe uh, it was Lisa's idea. You know, you, you blame it on a sister, you blame it on a friend. And then, of course, our moms would respond with that classic, well, if so-and-so jumped off a bridge, would you jump off of it too? And, and in the back of our little child minds, uh, I know some of us were thinking, wow, that sounds kind of cool, jumping off a bridge. Uh, as we get older and we become teenagers, our parents would sometimes ask us about our friends. And, and as teenagers, that annoys us. Uh, but they would encourage us to be careful about the people we, we choose to associate with. They did this, 
And, and later on, as we became parents, we, we did it with our own children as well because, because of our love, our love for our children. We, we wanted to keep them safe. We, we wanted them to make good life decisions. We didn't want them to get hurt. We, uh, we didn't want them to get mixed up in the, in the wrong crowd. And God's the same way with His children, with us. He, he, he doesn't want us to get hurt. He, he wants the best for us. He, he doesn't want us to get mixed up with the wrong crowd. And, and again, we can find this several places in Scripture, both in the, in the Old Testament and the New and this morning, though, I want us to focus on just a, a couple of verses in Proverbs. And uh, if you would, we'll look at them right now in chapter 13, Proverbs 13. We'll just look at two verses, verse 20 and 21. <clears throat> uh, I'll be reading from the New American Standard. It says, he who walks with wise men will be wise, but the companion of fools will suffer harm. Adversity pursues sinners, but the righteous will be rewarded with prosperity. Let's pray. Dear Father, we, we thank you again for your word this morning. Father, I just pray as it speaks to us today that your spirit would just move inside each one of us. Father, that you would speak to us individually as, as your will would have. And Father, may each of us respond in a way that would be pleasing to you in our best interest and according to your will. These things I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Harvey McKay, he wrote a book uh, called Swim with the Sharks. And uh, in this book, he shares the story about General William Westmoreland. And it seems that the uh, general was reviewing a, a platoon of paratroopers in Vietnam. And as he was walking down the line, he, he asked each one of them a question. He said... Uh, how do you like jumping, son? Love it, sir, was the first answer. How do you like jumping, he asked the next. The greatest experience in my life, sir, exclaimed the next paratrooper. How do you like jumping, he asked the third. I hate it, sir. He replied, then why do you do it, asked Westmoreland, because I want to be around guys who, who love to jump. This is, a, uh, this is what I think is a perfect illustration of the fact that sometimes we will, we will do some really crazy things, like jump out of a, a perfectly functioning airplane just to keep company with certain people. People who maybe we, we shouldn't even be, company, be keeping company with. We will do things that, that don't make any sense at all, that go against everything we've ever been taught, everything we have ever believed. Things that we know in our hearts and minds are wrong. Things that go against our morals. Things that are against the law. Things that, that go against what we read in God's Word. But we'll do them anyway. Just to remain part of this certain circle of friends. And that's a, that's a big part of the reason that we have this warning here in our text this morning. He who walks with wise men will be wise, but the companion of fools will suffer harm. 
Now some of you who may be sitting there saying to yourselves, oh wait a second preacher, just last week in your sermon, for those of you who paid attention last week, Jesus was defending himself for, for sitting with the tax collectors and the prostitutes and the other sinners. And yes, I, I remember in our, in our text last week, Jesus said, it is not those who are well who need a physician, but those who are sick. So which is it? Are we to keep our distance between ourselves and sinners, the unbelievers of the world, or, or not? Well, Jesus did spend a lot of time with his 12 closest friends, his disciples. He spent a lot of time with them. But he also spent a lot of time with the, many of the people who were considered to be outcasts of society, the sinners. However, his relationships that he had with these sinners, they were, they were always intentional. And what I mean by that is there was always a, a purpose. There was always a purpose in that relationship. There was always a purpose in each encounter he had with a sinner. Now Jesus met each sinner. He met him with love. But he also, he met him with truth. He told these people he told them things that they, they didn't necessarily want to hear, but he always told them things that they needed to hear. They, they never moved the, the direction of the relationship. Jesus was never swayed by their conversation to, to their point of view. He shared the good news. He, he, he shared himself. Let me give you a, a couple of examples. Uh, first, you remember the, the healing of the man at the, the pool at Bethesda. He'd uh, been ill for 38 years. And we find this written in uh, John chapter 5. If you want to look at this later. Uh, beginning with verse 6, it says, When Jesus saw him lying there, and knew that he had already been a long time in that condition, he said to him, Do you wish to get well? The sick man answered him, Sir, I, I have no man to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up, but while I am coming, another steps down before me. And Jesus said to him, Get up, pick up your pallet, and walk. Immediately the man became well, and picked up his pallet and began to walk. <clears throat> so Jesus, he met this man with a, with a heart of love and compassion. He saw his need. He saw him in his brokenness. And he immediately heals the man. And this man stood up and began to walk. Later, Jesus met the man again in the temple, and this time his words were a command to repent. In John 5, verse 14, it says, Behold, you have become well. Do not sin anymore, so that nothing worse happens to you. Jesus met the man with love. He had compassion for his condition, and he healed him. The man stood up for Jesus. Basically, they, they became friends in the process. But then, Jesus follows up with the truth. Repent and sin no more. Now there's love throughout this encounter. There is physical healing, but there is also a a spiritual healing that takes place. In another example, the woman caught in the act of adultery. And she's brought to Jesus by the scribes and the Pharisees. And, and in John 8, this, it, it says that they question Jesus, that the, the law commands that the woman should be stoned. But what, 
what does what do you say Jesus and Jesus responds he who is without sin among you let him be the first to throw a stone at her and the Bible says that one by one the men left until the only ones left were Jesus and this woman Again, Jesus, he met this woman with love and, and with compassion. And I'm sure she must have been overjoyed with the, with the kindness of her, her new friend. But Jesus still had, still had the truth to share with her. Truth that would bring her even greater joy if she would only listen to, to his words. In John 8, we read straightening up. Jesus said to her, Woman, where are they? Did no one condemn you? And she said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said, I, I do not condemn, condemn you either. Go. From now on, sin no more. The truth, repent and sin no more. Again, the relationship was filled with love and compassion. A physical life was saved. Jesus, with his words of wisdom, saved this woman from a stoning. But he also gave her true spiritual life if she would just listen to the wisdom of, her, of his words. So what do, we, what do we learn from these two examples? As Christians, we are commanded to, to take the good news to the world. We should never cease to take the light of Christ to, into the darkness. Christ has given us the example. We, we meet the unbeliever in their, in their brokenness and in their sin. And we share the, the hope of Christ with them. We should show the love and compassion of Christ in, in each encounter we have, in each relationship. But we must also be willing to share the truth of God in His Word. The love of God and the truth of God, they can never be separated. I kind of got away from our text a little. Actually, I guess uh, what I've done is told you what it doesn't say instead of telling you what it does say. But I hope you've taken some notes and you can always watch, uh, I guess, the recording on Facebook if you have any questions. But let's look again at that first verse. He who walks with wise men will be wise, but the companion of fools will suffer harm. Although we, we are to love everyone, our neighbor, our, our enemy, that, that doesn't mean that we are to be, to be friends with all of them. The Bible tells us in numerous places to uh, be careful what people we, we choose to associate with because not everyone has our, our best interest in, in mind. As the Israelites were camped on the plains of Moab, awaiting to take possession of the promised land. God spoke to Moses with these instructions as recorded in Numbers 33. He said, but if you do not drive out all the inhabitants of the land from before you, then it shall come about that those whom you let remain of them will become as pricks in your eyes and as thorns in your sides, and they will trouble you in the land in which you live. And as I plan to do to them, so will I do to you. Now what, what God is saying here is, don't hang out with these people. They, uh, they're going to cause you pain. They'll bring destruction to your people if you do. The judgment that awaits them will be yours if you, if you let them hang around. It's the same for us. It's the same for you. Who you choose to hang around with, they can bring pain, they, they can bring harm to you and your family. Remember our text, the companion of fools will suffer harm. 
you may, you may think that you would never become like those, those friends. Your faith is too strong. You're committed to, to living for Christ. In fact, you may even convince yourself that you'll be a good witness for them. You remember a man named Lot? The nephew of Abraham. According to 2 Peter chapter 2, Lot was a, was a righteous man. But in Genesis 13, it is written that Lot lifted up his eyes and saw all the valley of Jordan, that it was well watered everywhere. So Lot chose for himself all the valley of the Jordan, and Lot journeyed eastward. Lot settled in the cities of the valley and moved his tents as far as Sodom. What we get from these verses is that Lot pitched his, pitched his tent near Sodom, which was, which was known for its wickedness. And the men were, were sinning greatly against the Lord. And Lot was a righteous man, but he, he moved to the outskirts of, of Sodom and made camp. And later in Genesis 14, we're told that Lot is now living in Sodom. In verse 12, it says, They also took Lot, Abram's nephew, and his possessions and departed, for he was living in Sodom. So originally, Lot is living near Sodom, but outside the city. And, and now we're told that Lot has moved inside the city itself. He has moved from outside the wickedness to the heart of the wickedness. Now if we go back a few more chapters to chapter 19, we read this in verse 1. Now the two angels came to Sodom in the evening as Lot was sitting in the gate of Sodom. When Lot saw them, he rose to meet them and bowed down with his face to the ground. It's quite possible by his position here at the city gate that Lot was, a, was one of the leaders, a civic leader within Sodom at this point. And if this is the case, Lot has, has moved from, from pitching his tent on the outside of the city of Sodom to inside the Sodom to now he's a, one of the leaders of the, of the city. Sodom was a, a wicked city that was ultimately destroyed by God. And Lot was a righteous man, yet Lot was drawn into the wickedness of this city. It started out slow. He was camped on the outside of the city. But what happened? His association with the, with the people of the city, it, it drew him into the city itself. And over time, he's, he's drawn deeper and deeper into the lives and the inner workings of the city and all of its wickedness. And it began to, to warp his righteousness and to damage his family. And if you remember, if you remember the scriptures, he, he even offered up his own daughters to the, to the mob who had, the mob of men who had come to have sexual relations with the the angels, his guests at his own house. And he offered to save them by giving up his daughters. This slow process can happen to any of us if we aren't careful, if we don't watch who we associate with. There's so much deception. We must be vigilant. We must stay in God's word. We, we must be faithful in our prayer life. Our Christian fellowship, it's important. Something that I think we, we, need to, we need to consider. The world, and maybe even some of you here this morning, 
consider the church, big C, the universal church to include anyone who has their, has their name on a membership roll at a church somewhere. Anyone who claims, anyone who claims to be a Christian. The person may not actually be a follower of Christ. They may not have any desire to be obedient to God's word. But they believe in God or a God and, and they expect to go to heaven someday. They, uh, they may or, or may not attend church regularly. They may or may not pray often or, or even read their Bible. A large majority of them were baptized, but many of them were baptized as infants or without knowing or, or professing a personal faith in Jesus Christ. Many of these church members have, have never repented of their sin. Have never received Jesus as Savior and Lord of their lives. They have never experienced this personal relationship that, that He desires with each one of us. Some of them joined the church because that's, that's just what members of their family do. Some because their friends joined and they, and they wanted to be like them. They, they didn't want to feel left out. Some joined because they thought joining a church was going to keep them out of hell. Now here is the, is the truly sad part. Although many of these card-carrying church members don't attend church anymore. Many, many more of them are, are sitting in pews every Sunday listening to, to pastors tell them that they're okay in their sin. Even encouraging them in their sin. Telling them that the Bible no longer pertains to them. It's outdated. Many of these pastors never mention words like repentance. Obedience, judgment, or hell. The world is full of deceivers that are confusing believers and non-believers alike. But let me tell you, the, the church has its deceivers as well. The true church, the true church, the bride of Christ is present within what the, the world considers the church to be. These are the ones that, that Jesus will return for during the rapture of the church. And based on the condition of our churches today, the true church sadly is only a portion of the total church membership. Now maybe... Maybe you believe that the Sunday after Christ returns for his church, all the churches across this so-called Christian nation of ours are going to be empty because the church is going to be taken away. I don't expect that at all. And I'm not trying to be a prophet. I think the Sunday after the rapture of the church, churches everywhere are going to be full of church members crying out, Why? Why was I left? I expect there are going to be church members on that Sunday in church that haven't been in church for months or maybe years. I expect that there's going to be church members there that have been miraculously cured of ailments that they've had for a long, long time. I expect there are going to be church members there who, who finally have realized that God needs to be a priority in their life and not something that 
something that's second nature if there isn't something else going on that's more important. Matthew 7. Jesus speaking. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name cast out demons and in your name perform many miracles? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. According to to these words, many who, who call Jesus Lord are going to be disappointed. They're going to be shocked. And I believe they're going to be angry. I believe they're going to be angry at themselves for ignoring God's call on their life. I believe they're going to be angry that they were deceived. Church, we have no excuse. We are called to be different from the world. Listen to what Paul shared in Ephesians chapter 4. As a result, we are no longer to be children tossed here and there by waves and, and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, by craftiness and, and deceitful scheming. But speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in all aspects into Him who is the head, even Christ. No longer be His children. Grow up in, into Him. Church, we, we, need to, we need to grow up. We need to get off of the milk and, and into the meat of the Scripture. Father, let us not be deceived any longer. Let us pray. Dear Lord, I... I thank you for your word today. Thank you for your son, your spirit, your spirit that's with us now. And Father, I just pray that you move through each one today. That Father, we respond as you would have us to respond. That we would move Father, that the, the scales would be cast from our eyes, that we would no longer be deceived. Father, that we would see the truth and we would be bold in our love and our faith and our obedience to you. Father, I thank you and I pray your will be done. In Jesus' name. Amen. As we stand and, and sing our hymn of invitation, trust and obey. It'll be overhead if you'd like to follow along in your hymn on page 322. If the Lord is speaking to you this morning, we don't know the second, we don't know the hour, our time is, our time is over here on earth. And I just pray that if God is speaking, that you would answer that call today, this very moment. If you just need to move closer to God in your relationship, if you just need to move out of Sodom, if you just need to, to move away from that relationship, that friendship, I just pray that you will come and and kneel here this morning. The altar is open. If you have a burden of any type today that you don't need to 
to leave here with. Please come and pray as we stand and sing. Trust and obey. again we just thank you so much for this time together father we thank you for this opportunity to worship you father just go with us as we leave this place today may we honor and glorify you with all things all words all actions all thoughts 
Bless us and protect us until we can meet again. And these things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.